Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Gadir Abbas. I'm an attorney with the Council on American Islamic Relations. Um, we're uh, here today um, with a uh, uh, substantial array of civil rights groups and community groups, as well as lawyers and experts, um, uh, to announce the filing of um, uh, Abrar Omesh's lawsuit in the Eastern District of Virginia challenging uh, an instance of police brutality that occurred in March 2019, as well as uh, when taken into custody, the removal, the illegal removal of her hijab and photographing of her. Uh, that lawsuit was filed earlier um, today, uh, naming as defendant Stacey Kincaid, um, the sheriff of Fairfax County, as well as an individual um, police officer, the Fairfax County Police Department. Um, with us today um, are uh, many uh, uh, folks and civil rights leaders and activists and community leaders and activists. Um, we're going to start um, with uh, Lena Musri. Um, Lena Musri is the care litigation director and she's going to tell us a little bit about what happened and what the lawsuit seeks to accomplish. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Lena Musri. I'm the CARE National Litigation Director. This morning, we filed a lawsuit in the United States District Court in the Eastern District of Virginia on behalf of Abrar Omesh against Fairfax County and Fairfax County police officers for egregious and senseless violations of her constitutional rights. Abrar Omesh is one of three at-large members on the Fairfax County School Board. On March 5th, 2019, she was pulled over by a Fairfax County police officer for a minor traffic violation while she was on her way to a campaign rally. Within minutes of pulling her over, the officer began shouting at her. He forcibly yanked her out of her car and pepper sprayed her at point blank range. An internal affairs investigation later concluded that the officer violated departmental regulations by using unnecessary excessive use of force against Ms. Omesh and that she never presented any threat of danger that necessitated the use of force that was used against her. The officer later accompanied her to Fairfax County Jail, where, along with other officers, they forced Ms. Omesh to remove her hijab in plain view of male officers and detainees being held at that facility, just to take her booking photo. Her photograph without her hijab was then uploaded to a statewide database that's available to all law enforcements in Virginia and the public, anyone who requests it, causing her to suffer from irreparable harm and a continuing and ongoing violation of her rights to this day. The Department of State correctional facilities around the country, none of them require removal of the hijab or religious head covering for photographs that are taken for identification purposes. In fact, there is no law, legitimate law enforcement interest for requiring the removal of the hijab. The hijab is a core and central tenet of the Islamic faith. It's worn by many Muslim women around the world to safeguard their modesty. Fairfax County policies currently require the removal of the hijab for all booking photos taken and make those photos available to the public in blatant disregard of the law. Fairfax County is home to 55,000 Muslims. It's time Fairfax County, Fairfax County joined other law enforcement agencies in respecting and protecting the rights of Muslim women and people of other faiths. We have seen, unfortunately, a rising trend of Muslim women being forced to remove their hijab when they encounter law enforcement. Currently, there are lawsuits pending in Michigan, in Florida, and in California challenging similar policies. We filed this lawsuit on behalf of Ms. Amesh to both vindicate her rights, but also to impose a policy change that requires Fairfax County to respect the rights of Muslim women that wear the hijab. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Um, so you've heard a little bit about what the lawsuit is about. Um, let's bring on um, Abrar Omesh, um, the person who uh, was brutalized by um, police um, just uh, less than two years ago. Um, Abrar, can you share some thoughts with us? Absolutely. Uh, thank you all. And, um, you know, obviously appreciative of CARES uh, taking on this case and the importance of the matter at hand. 
you know, whether it's what we're seeing now in the Capitol and the conversations around race and policing in this country, what we saw this summer, or what's been going on for many years. Uh, this was a situation that I never expected being in, just like all of you probably would never imagine uh, in your life uh, having a situation like this. It's certainly not pleasant to have to imagine the prospect of uh, a lawsuit, um, of what that's going to entail, of putting my privacy on public display uh, and giving an opportunity for scrutiny. Um, you know, I happen to uh, be someone who is entrusted as a public official in my community. And while I do this in my personal capacity, no doubt, uh, it's it's something that colors the way I think about this and the way I uh, relate this to the importance of fighting for the future of, of what we're building in our community. Um, in the particular situation, you know, uh, uh, Ms. Musri uh, did speak to some of the details and, you know, the details are, are you know, they may vary case to case, uh, but the issues are the same. I mean, in, in my particular situation, you know, being stopped for a, a minor, uh, um, what was it? it was the accusation of a minor traffic uh, situation, not coming to a full stop at a red light before turning right. Um, and then having that within minutes escalate into an officer pulling a mace bottle in my face, yelling, get out of the car, grabbing my arm, dragging me out, um, ending up with a concussion. And, and, uh, and I, that only became more horrific with the hijab situation uh, in the detention center, which ultimately um, they found ha I, there was no reason to keep me there. Um, but really uh, reflecting on the fact that in that particular situation, I had explained many times what the hijab is about and the constitutional protections we have, uh, but but those didn't matter um, in that circumstance. And the, you know, I, I I I it's an unusual situation to be in as someone who's uh, always proud to fight for our community and and who's you know tries to think of higher ideals of what I'm advocating for or, or what we're pushing for to now have to tell a personal story or, or put my personal life on, on blast, um, especially to do with the hijab uh, issue. You know, I was, I'm someone who wore the hijab since second grade. Um, it's, it's something that I, I just, it's, it's, uh, it's really unconscionable for me to even imagine, not to mention the comments that were made, the, the, um, the attitude around it in not recognizing the seriousness of what that is. Now, with that said, of course, the bigger picture here is what's happening next. Uh, in in my you know in in my hope, this is an effort towards pushing for reforms on a broader scale. Whether that's demanding that of Fairfax County, whether that's demanding that of the state, I had been working for over a year and with care, some of Care's support, uh, with both the sheriff's office and the police department to clarify and explain the importance of. Uh, these matters and and wanting to see ref in the policies changes that are reflected uh, based on what occurred and have unfortunately seen very little uh, uh, response back um, and have only come to see that some of the facts we were working with weren't necessarily consistent with what I was being told. Um, and so I, I am now compelled to bring this lawsuit forward, uh, you know, in understanding the way change happens in our country across history. This is uh, a step that I hope will uh, uh, call for that and really bring back some of that momentum uh, that's important to, to make sure we have in pushing for the demands we have. And, um, you know, we've, we've, we have this uh, campaign, Fight for Five, which you'll hear more about later on, uh, that seeks to do that. And, and that's, I, you know, I see that as being a Muslim, you know, often interrupted by the call to prayer here. Um, but, but recognizing that I have a unique position with privilege to be able to do this, because I will tell you, there are ever since this happened, who I've, you know, the people who've come forward, the hundreds, the thousands of people impacted just in our county, not to mention the state and across the country in similar situations, whether it's women, uh, you know, and Muslim women with hijab issues, whether it's women of color who've experienced harassment, whether it's people of color, minorities, people with disabilities, the undocumented, you name it. Uh, the disproportionate impact that law enforcement has had on our communities uh, uh, is is untenable. It's unacceptable, and this is yet another example of how we are pushing to demand something different. Um, and I feel that this is my obligation to the community, not only in my personal capacity from what I experienced and truly never could have imagined undergoing, 
um, but for the broader, bigger picture in the long term uh, to, to ensure that these things don't happen again. Yeah, and we know they don't have to happen again because even police departments like the NYPD, you know, no friend to minority communities, you know, the police department behind NY, you know, stop and frisk, uh, uh, Muslim spying um, programs, you know, that police department allows Muslim women to wear hijab, you know, during uh, booking. And so we know it's possible. And like what Brar said, we also know that what happened to Brar is, is not unique to Abrar. We know that Fairfax County Police Department, especially in recent years, has been the perpetrator of other instances of police brutality. And so I want to bring on uh, Thorea uh, Hussein, um, who herself um, uh, experienced um, the, the wrong end of uh, excessive force um, from a Fairfax County um, a Police Department uh, officer. Salam alaikum, Thorea. Thanks for joining us. So can you tell us a little bit about what happened to you, um, please? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, it's uh, actually it's shameful that to say I've been through many, but I'm just going to mention two of them that really scarred me. Um, they were extreme. Um, one of them was um, complete racism. Uh, they accused me of something, and I had to, you know, go to jail for it. And even though I did not do it, so what I experienced inside the jail was horrific, same what Aprar said, they have to take my hijab off. And all what I remember, I said, I'm a Muslim, I can't do that. And they were laughing and joking about me. And they said, here, no, you have to take it off. And, you know, all of the officers were males, you know, nobody gave me an option, even though I mentioned to them, I'm a Muslim and I can't do this. Hijab is part of, of me. And nobody listened to me. So they took a picture of me as well, put it everywhere. And they forced me while I'm there, 28 days, I stayed there. Uh, they forced me to be all the time without hijab. And I remember I had a court during that time. Also, they bring me back, uh, you know, with now, without hijab. Uh, they, they forced me, I, I pray five times a day. So they said, no, I, I can use the cover. And one of the officers there, when I was using the sheets, the bed cover, to pray, she simply come. She was very aggressive. She gave me uh, like a, a, a long sheet with a punishment just because I was praying and covering my head with a bed sheet uh, because I was staying, at, you know, best place in jail because I have no any violence history or any criminal history. And she said, oh, that's not allowed or whatever. She didn't even talk to me. She said, like, OK, back your pack yourself. And you're talking. You make a religion. You're excuse." Because I was trying to explain to her, I pray five times a day and I need to cover to pray. So she said, you're making religion, you excuse, back your stuff and get out. So she took me to where, you know, mentally ill people is. I stay there uh, 24 hours when people can see me do anything, including using the bathroom. And I, when I ask why I'm here, said, oh, so you can pray whatever you want. So they were joking around. And then after that, I asked to talk to the sheriff if I accumulate any crime in the jail because I was reading the manual they give me. And they said, oh, no, you're not in trouble. You're just going to you know, move you somewhere else. And they end up moving me for, you know, like the 28 left for me, 20, day, 20 days left for me. They moved me to the worst place in jail where the killers and gangsters, you know, you know reside. And it was a torture till the end. And they didn't give me a Quran. They didn't give me a prayer rug. And I was just without hijab. And if I want to go to the gym, I have to wear shorts. Or I was staying in the cell 24 hours, no sun, no nothing. If I want to go to, to the gym for one hour, I must wear the shorts. So there was total disrespect. Even for food, when I was asking, that's a different thing too. I'm a Muslim. I don't eat certain things. They said, okay, that's what we have. Oh, we don't serve pork. And they do. So uh, it was total disrespect to my religion. The other incident was uh, the neighbors calls, you know, um, uh, police on me. They think I'm not home. And my son was crying and I was actually fixing something, taking something out of the car. My son was with me. So when the police came, they start screaming. And they, he was saying to me, like, say you did this, say you left. And I said, sir, I did not do that. Why are you saying you came and you found me here? So they were screaming. All the neighbors were watching. Uh, until his his partner told him you need to calm down and they would still harass me and I was just cool looking at them because I already had that horrific experience and I know how it goes on that's prepared me for this you know and, and I, I, they were just saying to me uh, oh you say say you did this and I said sir I did not uh, I did not do anything why you want me to, to admit something I did not do 
So they were there just to, to criminalize me, to take me to court. And I refused. I was very uh, patient with them. I was very polite. The neighbors said that all of them watched that. And uh, they called me and said, you know what? We're going to, you know, we decided we're going to take you to court. I said, okay, what do you want to do? Sign this paper. I signed it. And I went to court. There was no case. So they were totally harassment. They know that I did not do anything wrong. It was just total harassment to me. So I, I try to just not to take too much time, but many, many times, you know, police officers always stop me and assume that I don't speak English. They look at me. I'm a behavioral therapist. I'm a mother of six children. I've been active in the community forever. Everybody know me. I'm very passionate about equality for everybody in the community. And what's happening, it's totally unacceptable. And it's yeah. brutal and, and inacceptable. Yeah. And we, uh, you know, whenever there's an instance of um, uh, disregard for the religious rights of, you know, anybody, um, it's it's never, it's almost never an isolated incident. It almost always reflects a broader institutional approach to the religious rights of folks that are entrusted um, to their care. And so thank you, Thorea, for sharing that, um, you know, terrible thing that, terrible things that happened to you. And um, I think it shares that, uh, it shows that, you know, it's not, it's, it's not just a single instance that we're talking about. Asalaamu Alaikum, Thorea. Awesome. Okay. Uh, in addition to you've heard from Abrar, you've, you've heard from Thorea, I, I want to bring on a, a reporter now, Mike Stark. Um, uh, let's uh, bring on Mike Stark, who um, has also had uh, an unfortunate encounter with Fairfax County Police Department. Hi, Mike. How are you? I'm well, thank you, and good afternoon. Looking I'm here great. Today. Looking great today, Mike. Looking great. Looking great. Thanks so much. <laughs> I know. Uh, I understand that you've had something that happened to you. Can you can you share it with us? Sure. I just wanted to say I'm here today because it's inconceivable to me that Fairfax County, one of the bluest counties in Virginia, has not found it within itself to treat people like human beings. What you're asking for isn't a huge accommodation. It's respect for religion, and there's a substantial Muslim population in Fairfax County. It's incredibly diverse, but regrettably, the police force and criminal justice system, it just doesn't reflect the diversity of the community. So I'm here. Um, look, my story isn't as egregious as many of the others. But briefly, while I was working as a reporter in 2017 covering Ed Gillespie's campaign, uh, the campaign called down to the police. They knew me. They knew that my questions were hostile because I was working for Share Blue, a um, organization with a liberal agenda. And they um, told them that I looked like some kind of terrorist. So the police came up to me immediately swearing. And when I asked the police why they were swearing and used some choice words of my own, they arrested me. Six cops jumped on me. They beat me to the ground um, and took me off to jail. The whole story is illustrative of some of the problems that we're talking about today. While I was in jail, I was the only white person. I think there were probably two Latinos. They looked Latino to me. They may have been Arab or some other lighter skinned nationality. And there were 11 black men. I mean, it's beyond a stereotype. This is reality in Fairfax County. Different communities aren't policed the same way. After jail, I went to trial and the political leadership of Fairfax County showed up. They seemed much more interested in avoiding any kind of liability than in addressing the police abuses. On the stand, the police lied. Understand that I had video of everything that happened and everything the police said on the stand was a lie. They recruited witnesses that lied at my trial. Everything they said was a lie that was disproven by my video. The judge in the case was more interested in shuffling papers and doing paperwork than listening to the evidence before him. And at the end of the case, he summarily pronounced me guilty. I brought the evidence of the lies to internal affairs. I brought the evidence of the lies to Fairfax County and they ignored it. Nothing has been done. I'm not here because I hold a grudge. I'm here because I want Fairfax County political leadership to stop doing the easy thing and ignoring these abuses to join this movement, 
to bring accountability to Fairfax County Police. You know, when I went to the police social media pages that arrested me, they were festooned with Trump posts, pro-Trump posts. Now, we know what Donald Trump has had to say about Muslims and black people and police in general. It's no surprise to me that these police have treated what have turned out to be victims of the police that we're talking about today in the way they have. Fairfax County is one of the bluest counties in, in Virginia. I tell my kids, look, you're born here. You, you've, you're in a great neighborhood. You've got great schools. You're not suffering in any way at all. You can be anything you want to be. And I believe there's an analogy to me made to Fairfax County political leadership. You've got a great population. You serve a great voter base. We're educated and we want you to do the right thing. All you have to do is stop being afraid to do the right thing and implement some reforms. So that's why I'm here today. Thank you, Mike. And I just wanted to ask you one follow-up question. When you experienced that violence, what was it exactly that they did? They, did they hit you with batons? Did they tackle you? What? And if only if you're comfortable getting into a little bit, like what was the aggression? So uh, the first two policemen, I, I was trying to put my cell phone in my pocket and they took that as resistance. So they tackled me to the ground and then four other policemen jumped on top of me. While I was on the ground, I, my arm was caught underneath my body and I had four policemen with their knees in my back. So I couldn't give my arm to them. Of course, they took that as resistance too and shouted, stop resisting, stop resisting while they pummeled me some more. I explained to them that my arm was under my body and trapped under my body. And it's funny because afterward, when I asked the police if that was a trick they used, they laughed at me. Of course, that's a trick they use. Yeah. They want you to respect their authority. And if you swear at a policeman, they're going to impose a cost. And that's what happened to me. And that's what they wanted me to know from the beginning to the end. Yeah, yeah. And that's similar to exactly what happened with the bra, you know, uh, after the traffic stop, you know, the, uh, the police officer um, took her uh, inevitably human reaction to having a can of pepper spray pointed at her face. You know, you want to back up a little bit from that pepper spray. And, uh, they, you know, they, they called that, um, you know, resisting arrest. Um, thank you so much, Mike, um, for, for joining us and, and sharing that story um, uh, with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, so now I want to bring on uh, Josh Ehrlich. Um, uh, Josh Ehrlich is a, an attorney that um, uh, is uh, probably too familiar with uh, these uh, kinds of instances of police brutality and the abuse of um, folks that are um, in jails and prisons. And uh, we wanted him to share his thoughts um, uh, with us as well. Josh, please. Thank you. Um so first, I wanted to thank Abrar for asking me to participate in this. Uh, I'm a civil rights attorney, and I represent individuals that have experienced uh, police and prison abuse, among other things. Uh, specifically, the incident that uh, brought uh, or that came to Abrar's attention was a very similar incident to the one that she experienced. I, I represent an individual named Derek Thompson, and you know some of you may have seen the viral video of, of his arrest. Uh, last summer or so is when it went viral. Uh, and in that video, you see uh, Trooper Charles Hewitt um, terrorize my client who engaged in only passive resistance and simply was asking questions about his rights. Uh, the, uh, the video was most noted because towards the end of it, um, when, uh, when Hewitt decides to attack my client, he looks directly into the camera and says, watch the show, folks. Uh, and since then, uh, a pro-police organization has created commemorative challenge coins with, uh, Ms., uh, with Tr Hewitt's face on one side and watch the show, folks, also printed on the coin. And what um, is that? I'm sorry, I have to ask about that, Josh. Sure. Tell, what, these commemorative challenge coins, what, what, they're giving them out to officers that perpetrate instances of violence against members of the public? So there is, uh, there is a company that, that created these coins. They're for, they're for sale on the internet. Uh, 
I don't know anything at this point about, you know, who has received them. Um, there have been a couple of stories uh, and some, some press reports. Uh, the Miami Herald was on it at one point last year, trying to track this down. And at, at one point, the um, Vir- uh, Virginia was investigating. I don't know what's come of that investigation yet. Uh, we have filed suit in Mr. Thompson's case, it has, but we haven't served it yet. It's going to be uh, it's going to be getting moving here shortly, and we may learn more about the coins in that in that process. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the the issue is not you know this isolated incident, as you've heard today. Um, you know, this is endemic uh, to the culture of Virginia police. There's a, a culture of impunity. Uh, you know, I've represented individuals who uh, were tased for 45 seconds. Uh, without stopping. Uh, I currently represent an individual as a former inmate in Fairfax County Adult Detention um, who is an amputee and they uh, refused to give him access to an accessible shower um, so, and he couldn't wear his prosthetic in the shower. So you know, at some point, um, showering on one, on one leg on wet floors, he, did, he fell and, and hurt his head. Um, with you know no handrails uh, after he hurt himself eventually the the problem was resolved but it wasn't until after he hurt himself um yeah i've represented an individual in the past that was confined uh to five point restraints for 20 hours without a um uh, without a uh, a meal break or a bathroom break right I mean, it's it's not less than torture um and you know this it is top to bottom it is from the moment that you meet a cop on the street uh or uh or in your car to the maximum security prisons in the in the state that engage in this terrible conduct uh and you know it needs to stop and i'm happy to happy to be here today and hopefully i can be part of stopping thanks so much josh we're going to bring on uh, another uh, um, attorney, Justin Hansford, um, who's going to talk, uh, who's a professor of law at Howard University um, and uh, was involved in the Michael Brown ca- uh, case um, out of Missouri. Um, uh, do we have Justin? Uh, it looks like we might not have Justin right now. Um Let's go. I apologize for that. Um, uh, uh, Louis Aguilar, um, can we bring him on? Um, hi. Uh, uh, um, uh, he's with CASA. He's a, a Virginia director of uh, CASA Virginia. Uh, Louis, you're no stranger to these issues. Um, uh, can you share some thoughts with us um, yeah, yeah. about what brings you here today? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. Um, good afternoon to everyone connecting with us today. My name is Luis Aguilar, Virginia Director for CASA. We are a community-based organization with 10,000 Virginia members that fight for equity and justice. Today, what we wanted to do was to express our complete support for Abraham Omeish, as well as extend our solidarity with the Muslim community. Because whenever there is any case of oppression and injustice, we are not uh, we are united because we see that happening in our community. The Latino community and the broader immigrant community we're not indifferent to this. And uh, there is huge distrust uh, because of the injustices that happen between the police and our communities. Current law enforcement practices target policing at minority and lower income neighborhoods. As a result, most criminal charges are disproportionately assigned to minorities, the unprivileged and those with disabilities. These well-funded mass profiling efforts have yielded adverse outcomes without proven effectiveness. Practices resembling stop and frisk, community checkpoints, and predictive profiling must cease and disincentives ought to be in place. Again, this is not something new. We see this very often in Fairfax County, specifically in Bailey's Crossroads or areas such as Annandale. We insist on the respect for sincerely held religious beliefs and expect explicit legal prohibition of any requests to remove religious head coverings that do not respect religious conditions. We also support the limits on cooperation and information sharing 
with federal immigration enforcement agencies such as ICE and currently being adopted by the Fairfax County Police Department and the forthcoming board trust policy for other county agencies. We demand similar accountability and limitations of the Sheriff's Office. We have been working uh, for a long time with the ACLU People Power in ensuring that we communicate um, the need to change these policies and the need to change the way that we are policing our communities. The distrust does not happen because we simply communicate out to the public. The, the distrust does not happen because we're telling you right now that it is happening. The distrust is there and it is as palpable as ever. We as a society can do better, but it requires hard work on those that wield the responsibility of power to ensure that changes actually happen. We ask so those of you who are listening, demand that your public servants serve the public rather than being publicly funded government employees authorized to use force against us in this type of way against our communities. This is unacceptable and we must demand better. Thank you. Let me see if I can just uh, pick your brain for a little bit. I mean, what do you see as a community organization? Uh, I mean, what do you see in your community and their interactions with police department, with, with, with police in Virginia? One, one of the things that I would want to highlight is the distrust. We get calls from community members first to us, rather to the police department, because there's distrust in what will happen to them in terms of immigration status. There is distrust whether they should go to the police. And then when the police is in our communities so consistently uh, targeting our communities and assuming, for example, that our youth are involved in criminal activities and then using uh, practices resembling stop and frisk, uh, then the expectation from these communities is again, to distrust the police force and to understand that they are not there to serve our communities. And so there is a lot of work to go uh, towards changing all of this. So that's what we're seeing. And when we work with the community, we, we cannot uh, just tell them, well, you should trust the police. No, actual reform and actual uh, new policies need to be put in place. And so we look at the political power within Fairfax County to do that. Yeah, and we're hopeful that the tides are starting to turn, uh, you know, towards, you know, some, some of the reforms are, you know, very sensible. It, it was lawful in Virginia to do a no-knock warrant, just a bunch of guys with guns, you know, bursting into a house, you know, up until, you know, just a few months ago. And so I think uh, chipping away at this, you know, decades long process of empowering police is going to take some time. But uh, I think the community groups like CASA and, and the others assembled today um, are at the front lines in, in, in pushing back. Um, and the, the need to push back is extensive. Uh, Luis, thanks so much for joining us. Let's br bring on uh, Justin Hansford, who's um, a professor at Howard. Justin, we got you now. I know we had a little bit of a technical hip hiccup. Maybe the satellites were not aligning, but it looks like everything is fine. How are you today, Justin? How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'll be better if you know this effort um, succeeds. And so, tell us, Justin, share your perspective and uh, you know about and, and what brings you here today. Certainly. Well, for for me, you know, my my background is uh, as a civil rights attorney, but more importantly, as someone who was in Ferguson, my was as someone who has seen the the uh, powerful way that narratives can help to build a movement for structural change. I'm actually uh, very excited about the possibility of, of Fairfax and Virginia entering a, a new time period where there can be some real structural reform and more than reform, uh, structural redesign and reimagining of what it means to keep our communities safe and uh, to do so in response to uh, this this horrible situation where we, we see that um, law enforcement uh, is not just a anti-black project, it's a white supremacist project, meaning that that also will in include black communities, brown communities, Latino communities, Muslim communities, all, all these different communities that um, have to deal with uh, not just anti-blackness, but also the question of any any racial other, any 
member who is seen as not part of the dominant community. We're all seen as potential uh, threats to the, to our structure. And of course, in, in, in context of what happened last week, uh, we've seen how people can walk right into the Capitol and start snatching up uh, lecterns and, and walk right on out. And nobody there had to deal with the type of violence that uh, Abrar had to deal with because of her minor tra uh, traffic um, violation. So I, to, to me, that co comparison speaks for itself, you know, and this idea that, uh, you know, that's that's uh, justice or fairness is, is, is uh, you know, is, is completely, I think it's clear to everybody here that was injustice, it was unfairness, and we should not be paying our tax money to allow that type of structure to be upheld. Um, and I think what you're saying about reimagining is such an important piece of these efforts, you know, as as a Muslim, I, you know, we see in our community too often the expectation that if you're going to cross a border, if you're if you're going to go travel, th this is how Muslims are treated. You're patted down, you're harassed at the border, your children's diapers are searched. You know, that expectation um, is itself a challenge for communities pushing back against um, uh, egregious um, uh, police. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, overreach and, and these abuses. Um, so thank you so much, Justin, for, for yes, yes, please. One more, one more thing I would like to yeah. add, just, just to build on your of point, th that type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, very aggressive uh, racial profiling, it is the way that police are interacting with our communities that is the law. I think one thing that people forget is that the law is not what is on the books. The law is what is applied to people in our day-to-day -day interactions with the state or with the government. So although uh, you, you, there may not be a law that says we will racially profile black communities and Muslim communities and we will let white people walk through, walk in the Capitol, that's what the law is actually performing. That's what's, that's what's actually happening. And we, we, have to, we can't allow any sort of complacency or feeling like there shouldn't be change because you have laws that don't specifically target Muslims or or tar tar target Black people, so I, I'm very I'm very eager for this type of change to happen here in Virginia and as we go forward around the entire nation. Yeah, uh, thank you, Justin. Thanks, Justin. So um, we're gonna bring on uh, Suk Young uh, Oh. Um, Suk Young Oh is with Naka Sac, uh, uh, Virginia. Um, uh, Suk Young, uh, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about what, what brings you here and your perspective on, on these issues. Sure. Hi. Um, so I'm here today as the director of Nakasek Virginia. We're um, a nonprofit organization with offices in Annandale and Centerville. Um, and our mission is to organize Korean and Asian Americans to achieve economic, social, and racial justice. Uh, so what brings us here um, is uh, Abrar. Uh, she has been, um, as a member of the Fairfax County School Board, um, uh, one of the more responsive members when it comes to um, listening um, and addressing um, student needs. Um, and, you know, we, we do work with um, Asian American youth in Fairfax County. Uh, she's someone who, um, I'm not sure if folks know this, you know, hosts like like almost a weekly, um, I'm not sure what the word is, like a video uh, program with us, with students uh, to address like a range of issues um, that would impact public school students in Fairfax County. Um, so we're here, you know, I, I am here on behalf of Nakasek, Virginia, um, um, to um, support, you um, efforts to really address um, some very specific harm that uh, came to her as a uh, Muslim woman, uh, woman of color um, here in Fairfax County, um, and um, to support um, her efforts to um, also shed light on um, some other egregious practices um, and that have been long highlighted by many others. Um, um, uh, related to Fairfax County uh, Police Department. Yeah, yeah. and if, if I could ask, in terms of the Asian American community in Northern Virginia, could you, you know, give us a sense of, you know, what the, what 
issues related to law enforcement you see in, 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 in the community that you serve? Sure. Um, I know very specifically, and, and I believe there will be um, there will be some other colleagues who are going to speak much more directly uh, to this issue. So I won't say as much. Um, one of the uh, particular focus communities we work in among you know among Asian Americans, and we all know you know when you say Asian American, it's a very 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 wide and diverse community. Um, you know, East Asian, Southeast Asian, South Asia, and and that that that's just like by ethnic ethnic group. It certainly doesn't even speak to the linguistic and the religious diversities and all the other types of diversities within. In particular, we work with undocumented and documented um, uh, um, Asian Americans. And again, I won't say too much now uh, since another co colleague will address this, but certainly one issue um, that we are, we are aware of, you know, is what happens when, if you're an undocumented resident um, in Fairfax mm -hmm. County and you have an interaction with law enforcement. Um, I think there, you know, um, in the past, we've also heard of issues related to um, language access uh, for whether it was a victim of a crime or um, not being able to communicate um, at the time of the interaction with law enforcement um, are certainly issues that sometimes uh, come up with Asian American communities. And Asian Americans, um, I think, you know, whether, you know, we, we recognize that perhaps that, that in many ways, the, the type of, um, um, uh, the level and the intensity of the types of interactions that are had with uh, law enforcement are not the same as um, members of uh, various black and brown communities, right? Um, I mean, as a East myself, I am Korean American. Um, I don't carry the same worries and concerns as someone like Abrar who wears a hijab or um, uh, another colleague um, like Luis Aguilar who is a Latinx man. You know, I, I, I just don't. And But there are many um, Asian Americans who are very, you know, we, have had their eyes open, um, um, that, you know, uh, appreciative of black leaders who have made it very clear that um, that the police as an institution um, is in, you know, does, you, you know, create some serious harms um, as much as they, um, you know, don't, you know, as much as like the institution itself is not like, even if no one is intentionally trying to set harm, um, but there are many ways in which, you know, the policing um, in this country has is harmful to black and brown communities. So we stand here in solidarity with Abrar. Thank you, thank you Sukyang Oh. Um, that's Sukyang Oh with Nakasek, uh, Virginia. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're gonna bring on, I think the colleague that she was referring to, Diane Alejandro. Can we get Diane? over here. Diane Alejandro, ACLU, People Power Fairfax. How are you doing today, Diane? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me speak. And uh, I want to say, first of all, we stand in support uh, with Abrar and the Muslim community on this important issue. Uh, ACLU, People Power Fairfax is a grassroots organization that works to for immigration reform and police reform. We have about 4,000 members in Fairfax County and I am their lead advocate. And I have uh, had the pleasure of working with a number of the folks on the call here who are doing great work, including Abrar. Um, just to mention the, the events last week, and uh, that's all seared in our mind, the two systems of justice for uh, white America and people of color. Um, you look at Fairfax and it's a progressive county and we think that can't happen here, right? Till we hear these stories. Um, and it's not just the stories, the data proves the same thing. Um, and that's an area where we have spent a lot of time on. And it's, it's troublesome because it is, the fact it really is a progressive county. We have excellent 
uh, leadership on the Board of Supervisors, and this is a county that has worked on police reform since 2015. Uh, and yet, you look at the situation, you see that disparity in arrests for people of color is increasing. It's not getting better. Uh, it's getting worse. Uh, use of force disparity is getting worse. Discipline is, uh, the system is abhorrent in terms of accountability for police. Uh, you know, there's just uh, inadequate discipline as is. I like to say, if you drive your car improperly, you can get fired from the Fairfax police. Uh, if you use use of force, uh, racial <laughs> profiling, you know, we have 440 cases of those in the last four years. We have a total of seven reprimands, either oral or written in that area. 45% uh, of the vehicle cases end up with huge consequences. Uh, something's wrong with this system. Um, the leadership is, um, unfortunately, I think, is now at the, well, I guess this is progress. In 2017, um, I was almost kicked out of a meeting with Fairfax officials for suggesting there was racial profiling by some officers. Uh, the meeting ended at that point. To thag, skip forward to last year, we now have folks who are willing to recognize that there are a few bad apples. I have not heard anyone uh, in leadership, unfortunately, go so far as to own up to the fact that there is systemic racism. And I think this is a real problem. It's healed. If you don't admit it, it's not going to change, right? Um, so we're in a situation where blacks are seven times more likely to be arrested than whites. Wow. Uh, seven and a half times likely to have use of force. Um, and there is progress being made. Uh, and I won't say it's at the margins, it's more fundamental. Luis mentioned the police general order and the trust policies. These are great steps forward, but I think what we need to have is to face up to the problem and not just, you know, changing the policies is the first step. They have to be implemented. People have to take them to heart. And then, of course, there are all the other changes that need to still go for accountability. The civilian review panel actually investigate um claims and not just be asked to rubber stamp what the police does uh qualified immunity is a problem um and the sheriff is not a held accountable and that has to change um i can go on on the list and i i don't know if other folks are going to go on that on the number I'd like, you to go on. I'd like you to go on a little bit longer diane if you can well uh I really think the uh, the internal uh, disciplinary process needs a real revamp. I mean, the system, it's just an, you know, it is an endorsement of, of what officers do when it comes to other people. Um, and there need to be fundamental changes. Uh, obviously, I think you need the outside review. And we've started that process in Fairfax County with a civilian review panel. But it's not, uh, they don't have the power to investigate. They don't have the power to impose consequences. Um, and it's inadequately staffed. It's just, uh, you know, They've had one case where they found the possibility that there might be racial profiling. Yeah. Really, you know, just I one, mean, it's just, one, just that one, <laughs> just that one, you know, yeah. and we know of so many. And, yeah. and, and so we hope the new police chief, when he comes uh, or she, uh, you know, is, uh, is more tuned to these issues 
but unless the leadership across the board really faces up to the problem being there, I don't think we're going to see meaningful change. So let me ask you a difficult question here. I mean, how do you, I, I, it seems like from what you, you know, uh, what you're saying is that there is more pressure on these leaders to be responsive to the issues that you know groups like the ACLU, NACASAC, and CASA and CARE are bringing to the table. I, but I mean, they're still they're still not acknowledging the issue. I mean, what do you think it'll take for a police leader to say, you know, we are? It's hard. It's hard to say the thing that I'm in charge of is a racist enterprise that does racist things all the time. You know what? I, I, I can you imagine? Help us imagine. Like, what would it take? What would need to happen for an officer, a leader in in the law enforcement to take that kind of approach? Yeah, I think that the leader of uh, the police has a rare opportunity, assuming, um, as I think is is tends to be historically true, that it's someone that comes from the outside. Uh, and I'm not, you know, I don't want to say that it has to be that, but a fresh start may be a good thing. Um, but uh, are they going to have to be a magician? Probably. <laughs> and that's probably not going to be the case. So it's yeah. going to take folks like you and us and everyone yeah. else to keep the pressure on. Yeah. They It took, Louise mentioned the trust policy, Cuss, and we worked on so hard. It took us three years to get yeah. that. And it's a great policy. Uh, but it took three years, right? Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. we and we see so many of the reimagining police things. How long is that going to take? We got to keep working, and that's yeah, yeah. That's, that's the that. only thing that's I know that. to do. Yeah. Well, well, we're doing we're putting in some work uh, today. Um, so thank you so much, Diane, for sure. for joining us, and uh, I look forward to hearing more from you. So last but uh, definitely not least, um, Steve McCullough, a uh, community wow. activist, wow. let's bring him on. Steve, how are you? Good. How are you? Doing good. Those bookshelves look great in the background. They look very nice. <laughs> So, Steve, you're um, uh, you do a lot of uh, a lot of things in the area. Can you share with us your views here? What brings you to the to today? Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to join you. Um, I come here as a community, just as a citizen, um, and a concerned, very concerned citizen. I uh, I am. I first want to say um, I'm in full support and in solidarity with Abra Mesh and the Muslim community as a whole. Um, I think uh, I've been in Northern Virginia for um, a little over five years now and moved here from Chicago. Um, I've been involved um, both directly uh, with law enforcement, working with them in community, um, both here in Chicago, as well as being, um, I have an opportunity, um, part of my career working in uh, within law enforcement in the prison systems in Illinois. So I know firsthand um, what uh, abuse and violation violations of civil rights look like. And I just want to be here to um, provide my own uh, t uh, support for Abra and what she has experienced. Um, I think if we want to live in, and, and thrive in a community um, that has positive law enforcement, that uh, that these things cannot happen, and that uh, you know violations of civil rights um, build distrust um, in any community. Um, what's unique about um, Fairfax in Northern Virginia is its diversity and um, and its uh, ability to, as was said before, you know, be live and work in in an area that is so diverse and, and thriving. Um, I first ran across a bar um, as a part of um, work uh, in the school district and trying to build and bring, uh, uh, create equitable environments for all students. If, we're, if we want to create a world where uh, that trust uh, between police and 
and, uh, and community is there, that we want to create a world where um, we're dismantling the school to prison pipeline. Uh, these things cannot happen and can't stand. Um, I think about our work uh, going forward uh, in, and really want to support uh, the um, Fight for Five initiatives that Abrar has uh, put forward. What strikes me in that is uh, the linking of systems, whether it be healthcare and education, and social service, um, policing and law enforcement as a system uh, is, a, is, is critical in that. All these systems have to work together uh, effectively, which means um, if one is broken, um, then the whole, the, all the other systems have uh, brokenness to them. So um, I, my personal uh, commitment is to continue to be of support uh, to Abrar um, and as well as to bring about fundamental changes in, in terms of how policing is, um, happens. Chicago is no model, <laughs> don't, you know, and, but it, it, uh, and I think um, Fairfax police, uh, you know, um, mirror that where it's the majority white force imposing its will on communities of color. Um, that fundamentally has to change. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, whether myself or other civil rights organizations, community-based organizations, need to be involved in the process of selecting the next next chief of police. Um, need to be more involved in uh, how policing operates. Uh, need to be at the table when uh, decisions on, are made on training and policy, discipline, et cetera, of our law enforcement uh, officials. So um, I stand in um, solidarity as always, and I just wanted to express myself as a, as a parent of a 17-year-old and an 11-year-old who are starting to um, go out into um, the world and into this community. Um, I want them to both have their eyes open uh, about the injustices that happen, but I also want them to be um, protected um, at the same time. And, and I want to make sure their civil rights will not be violated. Um, but, uh, and I want to use uh, Abrar, um, and I'm so proud and of her to be able to stand up and testify on her experience because it, it sets the tone for everything and everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Let's, let's bring Abrar back um, just for a moment and we're going to conclude. Abrar, you know, we've, we talked about what happened to you. Um, we talked a little bit about the, um, you know, the variety of groups that have gotten together to um, demand a set of reforms. Can you tell us a little bit more about, about that, the groups involved and, and what those things are? Yeah, absolutely. And um, thank you, you know, Gadir and Care for your support on that. And, um, you know, Stephen just mentioned the Fight for Five is really a call for uh, reforms on various fronts with the eventual hope that we can reimagine what these things look like in our community to invest in education, to invest in public health, uh, to invest in mental health services and uh, human resources that we have in our communities uh, to better build that trust uh, and to send the right people for the right uh, crises or the right issues that are going on. Um, so we're really proud to have a long list of signatories who not only support this, but are standing in solidarity alongside us and calling for a number of demands. Um, we have, of course, CARE, uh, the ACLU People Power, CATSA, Edu Futuro. We have NACASEC Virginia, the Centerville Immigration Forum, the Virginia Coalition of Latin American Organizations, the Justice for Muslims Collective. We have Stop Police De Terror DC, If Not Now DC, Sanctuary DMV, Stop Police P Project Terror DC, we have Defending Rights and Dissent, the U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations, Empower Change, MGAGE, the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, the Islamic Circle of North America Council for Social Justice, the Partnership to End Gendered Islamophobia, the Muslim American Society, the Libyan American Alliance, Malika, Reviving the Islamic Sisterhood for Empowerment, Heart Women and Girls, the National Network of Arab American Communities, and Isarun, all of whom have signed on, and we continue to see folks' names of uh, local leaders and uh, additional groups that have uh, been emailing, just as we're in this press conference, about signing on. And we call for a number of things. Number one, this is for the local and state level officials. 
We are asking for folks to condemn what occurred and to condemn such examples that are persistent and widespread throughout our, our county and our state. We are asking for their response on the five pushes. We are fighting for facts. Uh, transparency and, and provision of these personal records, both on no doubt the county level, but also within the law and the state level for fairness, which a, a number of our partners today spoke to uh, and the disparate impacts and taking that seriously. And we outlined some of those specifics in the letter. Uh, we call for follow-up, which includes, of course, the hijab issue and related matters to this lawsuit that we wanna see in effect. Uh, freedom, of course, for our communities um, to, to take their agency and have our county be a place and our state be a place that supports them with the appropriate resources um, so that, as we mentioned, that they have social service supports that uh, prevent the need in the long term, which brings us to our last fighting for our future. Uh, and that's really where my, many of my roles come together. Um, and I know all of our investment in building a better future for our youth, um, for what this county, what the state, what this country are going to look like moving forward um, as we really uh, of center the human being and value the dignity of the human being um, by thinking of different ways of, of uh, policing. Well, I shouldn't say policing, of, of managing our communities and empowering people um, to eliminate whatever uh, alleged need there is for law enforcement. Um, so we're really proud for, uh, to have this solidarity and we look forward to people um, uh, posting and sharing their support, using the, using the hashtag fight for five, that's the number five, sharing their stories, um, using, you know, hashtag fight for me. And then we have a number of other ways of supporting that our, our partners will be posting on social media um, and pushing out. So um, thank you, Gadir, for giving us that opportunity. And, and I'm proud to stand with CARE uh, in coalition with all these other groups uh, to demand these changes. And we will be monitoring and are expecting uh, changes. We're not going away, and and we need to make sure that um, our future is, is better prepared. Um, you know, to to empower our families and our kids, um, and and not what not like what we're seeing uh, today. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Abrar, um, uh, and thank you all for joining us um, out there. Um, if any um, journalists have any questions, um, you could feel free to reach out to me, uh, g a b b a s at care dot com or um, reach out to media at abraromesh.com um, for copies of the lawsuits or any um, type of um, records related to the incident. Again, thank you for joining us. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum.